Thomas watches as a star player stumbles onto the field, barely conscious, misses a perfectly thrown ball, and collapses on the astroturf. Peter gets himself up, brushes off, and tries again. He fails to catch the ball a second time. Thomas and the other coaches have discussed Peter's behavior these past few weeks. Their star player certainly has not been doing well. He usually shows up late to practice, if at all, and never plays well. This looked like it could lead to the death sentence of their three-year-long undefeated streak. The first step of the decision-making process is identifying that there is a problem or opportunity available. Thomas surmises that this case is certainly not an opportunity. The second step of the process is setting goals and criteria for the decision. Thomas wants the team to be functional. He wants all his players to be on time and give it their all. He cares about each individual player, but he does not have the time to get into their personal problems, and he has enough players to be able to lose a few. Thomas uses the bounded rationality model first. According to this model, the person making the decision analyzes one alternative at a time and accepts it if it meets the minimum requirements. He identifies a possible solution which is motivating Peter with a speech, as his intuition prompts him to. He goes out on the field and tries to motivate Peter with vigor. Peter nods his head and agrees with what the coach says, but his behavior does not change. After implementing this decision and having it not satisfice, Thomas decides to start formulating alternatives beforehand and choosing the best possible one. Since this has gone on for several weeks and Thomas wants a solution that will have the highest chance of success, he chooses to try the rational model for decision making. He begins brainstorming ideas and alternatives that meet his criteria. He is in his study, sees an ad for advice on how to deal with these types of situations, and considers using the Delphi technique, which involves asking the advice of experts. He, however, believes that experts in that sort of field spit malarkey and is not interested in what they have to say. Thomas comes up with a few options. He could have Peter committed to rehab, have a heart-to-heart -heart with him, make the team do drug tests, or cut Peter from the team. Thomas sees that all his decisions are basically programmed decisions. They are routine for this kind of behavior, but he cannot think of anything else. He could bring in Brian to help because Brian can come up with non-programmed decisions, but he decides not to because Brian experiences escalating commitment, which would be bad if this decision turned out not to work well. Now it is time for Coach Thomas to evaluate his alternatives. In each of the decisions he comes up with, Thomas tries to think of the worst outcome, and by doing this, he is his own devil's advocate. Thomas does not want Peter sent to rehab because that would cause unnecessary media attention to the team. He could try drug tests, but then all of the other players who did drugs and still performed would be punished for Peter's mistake. Thomas already tried a speech with Peter, and though he could possibly be reach him with a heart-to-heart, -heart, he does not want to exert that effort or show the level, that level of vulnerability, especially with one of his players. Thomas decides that cutting Peter is the option that will benefit the team the most, as they will no longer be dragged down by his inferior performance, and Peter will have time to reflect on his decisions. Coach Thomas implements his decision by approaching Peter after the next practice and telling him that he is off the team. You're going to want to sit down for this, Pete. You've had a good run on this team. I'm proud of your achievements, and I want to thank you for helping us get to the championships last year. Look, you're a good t kid, and I know you have potential, but you've been getting in your own way. I've told you time and time again that you need to show up to practice and to be on time. You just don't listen. I don't know if it's the drugs, and don't try to deny it, or something else, but whatever is causing this behavior, it is up to you to address it. Now I can't just rely on your word that you're going to change, so don't try and convince me. If You're cut from the team, Peter. If you get yourself together by next year, maybe you'll make tryouts. If not, well, that'll be a shame. After he makes his decision, his other coaches admit the solution was heuristic, as it solved the problem but was not the most optimal decision. My decision this time was not the result of satisficing. Although I made previous decisions to that end, I evaluated this decision with more care and forethought. 
From now on, we should have a standard operating procedure that involves all the coaches. I suppose that's fair, but I still believe I made the right decision. Perhaps next time we can use the nominal group technique, where the group goes through the rational decision process together with multiple advocacy, meaning that more than one person can play devil's advocate for each alternative. Whatever you say, Dale. Let's just get back to work for now. The last step of the decision-making process is monitoring the results. Thomas will now take note of how his team reacts to the cut and how it affects their playing. He will also keep a lookout for Peter next year at tryouts to see if his decision caused Peter to move in a better direction.